For weeks, we've watched demonstrations build, but today the fighting reached the quarters of power. The presidential compound came under attack. There you can see smoke rising over the Capitol after sources said RPGs hit the compound's mosque while the president was there for Friday prayers. President Ali Abdullah Saleh was injured. A government official says he has a slight head injury, but he's not been seen publicly since then. Several other top government officials were also hurt. A Muslim cleric, along with several bodyguards, were killed. The president did speak on state-run TV. Only his voice could be heard, no pictures of him. He blamed the attack on, quote, gangsters and insists he's in good health. There's also a new video showing what looks like a violent government crackdown against protesters demanding the president step down. Just today, there was gunfire in the streets of the southern city of Taz. This video was posted on YouTube. A youth activist in Taz says four anti-government protesters were shot today during Friday prayers. Government security forces fired protesters at various locations across the city, including Freedom Square. Anti-government protesters throwing rocks in Taz as they're reportedly shot at by riot police. And heavy black smoke is seen pouring from the area. Now, unlike many countries in the region, many people do have access to weapons in Yemen. And there are reports gunmen supporting the demonstrators burned an armored vehicle belonging to security forces. In the other cities, there have been huge crowds like this one gathering, chanting anti-government slogans. As we said, day after day now, week after week, we have seen images like that out of Yemen. President Saleh, who's been in power for more than three decades, has several times agreed to resign, only to pull out at the last minute. It's important to note Yemen is home to the terror group Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which has been behind a number of planned attacks on the U.S. A short time ago, I spoke with an American named Jeb Boone, managing editor of the Yemen Times, a Global Post correspondent. He's in Yemen. He saw the attacks on the presidential compound. We want to point out we had problems with the phone connection, so we decided to add subtitles because we think it's important that you know what's going on inside this country, this critical turning point. Here's the interview. So, Jeb, you were near the presidential compound when the fighting began, when it came under attack. What did you see? What did you hear? Right. As I drove through the area in uh, a cab, actually, shooting an RPG fire across the road that I was traveling down, one RPG round actually was about 20 yards in front of the cab I was in before it struck the wall of a compound of one of the opposition tribal leaders um, and as it was happening, people in surrounding restaurants sort of folded out and go for cover. Um, and some of them were actually armed and started shooting in random directions in sort of a, a desperate now that he's been personally attacked himself. So, I mean, at this point, is this a, now a full-on civil war? I don't think we've reached that point quite yet, but it has the incredible potential to spread. Uh, Sali has fought with a different tribal confederation 30 miles northeast of the capital. And in that fighting, this tribe took over a Republican guard base, shot down one helicopter, and forced two other helicopters to land before they captured them. Uh, and these tribes have often expressed that they're willing to come to Sana or to other cities to fight against uh, the government forces that are engaged uh, in their fellow tribesmen. Like many dictators in the region, President Saleh has often said, you know, sort of played himself as the only bulwark against Al Qaeda. There is obviously Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, very strong in Yemen. The government is already reporting that some areas of the country have been taken over by al-Qaeda. Is that true? Is that accurate? Unfortunately, it is accurate, but al-Qaeda was only able to move into these areas of the country after Saleh removed his military from the area. And these are the elite counterterrorism units that have been trained by, trained by the Americans and the British and who have been get, engaging these al-Qaeda militants for months now, and they've had them on the run. And for some reason, he's ordered his troops to leave these areas where there's a significant risk uh, of al-Qaeda in the area. And where do you see this going, Joe? Uh, I don't think the violence is going to stop anytime soon, and I, and I do expect that he's going to use his last option that he hasn't used in the city, 
uh, airstrikes against the tribe. I mean, efforts to push them out. Uh, the violence definitely doesn't show any sign that it's going to let us anytime soon. Jeb, I appreciate you talking to us. Stay safe. Yes, thank you. Well, Jeb said that al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is gaining ground in Yemen, taking advantage of the chaos. It's the same group linked to various terror plots, including the Christmas Day underwear bombing on a U.S. airliner. Now, I talked about its growing reach in Yemen and other concerns with Christopher Dickey. He's Middle East editor for Newsweek and a contributor for the Daily Beast. Also, Fareed Zakaria, host of GPS here on CNN and editor-at-large of Time magazine. From, from a security standpoint, what does Yemen in crisis mean? I mean, it seems like it is on the brink of civil war. Yeah, it looks like it's really on the, break of, on the brink of going from a fragile state to a failed state and maybe multiple civil wars and all kinds of chaos. And from an American point of view, from a security point of view, that's close to disastrous because that's exactly the kind of situation that al-Qaeda and other groups can take advantage of. You basically have a vacuum of power. Uh, it's, places, it's a place that the U.S. can't reach into very easily. And the next thing you know, we're looking at another Somalia, another right. Afghanistan. And, uh, and I mean, the dictator has, or, or the president, um, has, has often said, like a lot of dictators in the region, that he's the only bulwark against al-Qaeda. But in Yemen, you actually do have a very strong presence of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, there's no question that al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is the strongest uh, Islamic terrorist movement directed at the West, directed at America, um, other than the one in Pakistan. And it is quite sophisticated. So re remember that last attack, which was those printer, uh, the, pr the bombs in the right. printer cartridges. That was actually quite sophisticated. That was not just a guy, you know, trying to light his shoes or set off his underwear. This was a pretty sophisticated, it suggested, uh, sophisticated bomb making techniques that they have. And to your point, Anderson, uh, President Saleh is now withdrawing all his forces from the peripheral parts of, of Yemen, consolidating power. But in, in a sense, he's ceding ground to al-Qaeda because the right. people who are taking over in, those, in, in town after town are al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So he's presenting the world and Yemen with a, with a pretty stark choice, which is if I go at this point, these guys are gaining ground. Do you really want the country to go al-Qaeda? And, and al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is run by this American-born cleric, uh, al-Waqi, they're actually kind of, I mean, uh, very creative uh, in, sure. in their terror. I mean, it's not going for what Al Qaeda Central w wanted, which was huge 9 11 style attacks. It's much more, it's smaller attacks, but they seem much more kind of uh, aggressive about well, it. Much more imaginative. Imaginative. I mean, on the one hand, they're willing to go for much smaller targets than Osama bin Laden was willing to go for. Uh, so they'll just try and take out one airplane with a guy who can blow, him, blow up his underwear or they'll try and take out the head of uh, security in, in Saudi Arabia, or they'll send these printer cartridges that will basically paralyze international air freight uh, for several days. So they'll do these imaginative things, and even when they fail to go off, they say, look what we were able to do. Awlaki is a great publicist and a good terrorist, and he's been very successful at that. But you also have to remember that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is a relatively small organization. We're talking at most a few hundred people. So even finding a few hundred people in a country in chaos becomes more and more difficult. The U.S. invested a lot of time and a lot of effort in working with counter-terror and intelligence forces in Yemen. Right. And of course what's happening now is that we're flying blind because those forces, as Farid is suggesting, those forces are now concentrating on keeping Saleh in power or just keeping their own. And if it becomes a failed state, I mean, if it becomes, I mean, already large parts of the country are kind of beyond government control or, or very limited government control, um, then what? I mean, it becomes another, uh, a more efficient well, then Somalia? We, then we have a, a real mess on our hands. And you're also going to have a, a risk of a, a lot of displaced people. I mean, this is a country that's running out of money. It's running out of water. It's running out of fuel. It's running out of everything. And it's certainly running out of order. So you could just have, let's put aside the terrorist issues, you could just have an enormous imploding population, 24 million people, with no place to go and nothing to do. Well, and the place they'll go or we'll try to go is Saudi, to go. Saudi we'll Arabia. Yeah. You know, the two, you know, with all this, this turmoil in the Middle East, there are really two places you need to worry about, as for Americans particularly. Saudi Arabia because of the oil, and Yemen because of al-Qaeda. Hmm. Uh, strangely, they border one another. And so now instability in Yemen has the potential to cause some instability in Saudi Arabia. And if you get instability in Saudi Arabia, you get $250 a barrel oil and po potentially another recession. And, and what the U.S. now seems to be trying to do is basically broker some sort of exit strategy for 
Sally, but then what? I mean, well, but this is the problem. We think we have all these contacts, and we go into broker and exit strategy, and, and this is what uh, Ambassador Frank Wisner tried at one point with, uh, with Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. And then all of a sudden, there's all this backpedaling. You, you go away, and they don't leave. They stay. Uh, Sally can't imagine Yemen without him, and he can't imagine himself without Yemen. They, and, all these people start to believe that they are the country. That I mean, they are like indispensable, Mubarak, right. exactly. Well, and, and also there's a web of corruption that is beyond them. You know, it's the families, it's the courtiers, and so they, they cut a deal which, you know, gets maybe President Saleh gets a nice villa in the south of France, but all the others right. say, wait a minute, what about us? And they are refuse to do it. And so, uh, it's, uh, so much of what seems to be happening here is, as Chris was saying, there are so many competing factions at this point. Uh, the government doesn't even control that much of the territory anymore anyway. So if he leaves, you might put a vice, let's say the vice president becomes president. You still face the two, re the, the two rebellions, the Al-Qaeda problem, the fact that there is a, this economy in free fall. All that still remains. You know, the Saudis, the Americans, everybody who's interested in Yemen has been working very hard now for months to make a transition, a smooth transition. And as you say, every time we've come close, Saleh has backed away. So ultimately, he's creating a situation where there cannot be a smooth transition. And I think we're, we're just about at that point right now. Thanks very much. Uh, let us know what you think about it all. You can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter, at Anders Cooper. I'll be tweeting tonight. Up next, former presidential candidate John Edwards indicted. He says he's done bad things but didn't break the law. Joe Johns was in the courtroom today. We'll talk with him and CNN senior legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin, who says the government's uh, going to maybe have a tough time proving its case. Also tonight, did you see what happened in the courtroom today in the Casey Anthony trial? She's accused of killing her two-year-old daughter. Her lawyers say her little girl drowned accidentally, and they covered it up. Well, either way, Casey Anthony has been spinning a web of lies to cops and to her own family. She's made up a story about a nanny who never even...